Okay, good morning and uh, from Europe and uh, good afternoon from uh, Asia. I'm Dr. David Quack from Malaysia and I'm happy to uh, start off the session for the ESC Asia with the collaboration of the APSC and the AFC. And we welcome you to this uh, edition of uh, updates. In particular, today we are going to discuss the uh, ESC guidelines with regards to sports cardiology. And uh, to begin with, we'll let's listen to some video uh, that has been taped with Professor Sanjay Sharma. Can we have the video, please? We're living in an era where there's a trend towards a sedentary lifestyle, and there is an emerging pandemic of obesity that is associated with an increasing prevalence of high blood pressure and type two diabetes mellitus. The promotion of exercise is now at the forefront of all medical organizations to curb these risk factors. And hence these guidelines are a welcome recommendations. These guidelines cater for individuals with risk factors for coronary artery disease and a diverse spectrum of cardiovascular diseases, promoting safe exercise in our general population. One of the most important things, of course, is to identify middle-aged and older people who may have quiescent coronary artery disease that may trigger an exercise-related myocardial infarction. In this respect, we have a pragmatic approach that utilizes the presence of symptoms and established risk factors, as well as the score system to identify those that are high risk and very high risk. And if these individuals want to participate in exercise or competitive sport, then they should have an exercise stress test or functional imaging before going into intensive exercise. When it comes to heart failure, the emphasis is on optimization of medical therapy, risk stratification and assessment of functional capacity before those individuals with in NYHA or functional class one and two can engage in moderate or occasionally in high intensity exercise. When it comes to bowel diseases, things are relatively simple. If people have mild valvular heart disease, then all exercise is permissible. Conversely, those with severe valvular heart disease should only engage in the current ESC recommendations of 150 to 300 minutes of moderate exercise. When it comes to the cardiomyopathies, we've got some novel things. Historically, individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy had very conservative exercise recommendations and were advised a relatively sedentary lifestyle. But with emerging evidence over the past few decades, our current recommendations suggest that those people who are asymptomatic, have morphologically mild disease, and a low ESC risk profile may engage in all competitive sport, except where syncope may cause trauma. On the other hand, we are much stricter with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, even those who are genotype positive and phenotype negative, these individuals should only participate in mild or moderate exercise, but intensive exercise is a no-goer. There are many other no-nos or don't-dos, apart from severe valvular heart disease and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, individuals with poor left ventricular function and active myopericarditis should not engage in high-intensity exercise or high-intensity competitive sport. As far as individuals with anticoagulation or implantable cardioverter defibrillators are concerned, we advise against collision sport or sport that involves bodily trauma that could result in a catastrophic event or even damage to the defibrillator. Most importantly and imperatively, we encourage shared decision making that all exercise and the pros and cons of exercise and the potential risks of exercise in any one cardiovascular condition should be discussed with the individual before promoting exercise and these discussions should be documented clearly in the notes. I really do hope that you will enjoy the recommendations and look forward to the publication myself in the next few days. Thank you. And uh, today we are really privileged to have with us the uh, professors uh, Sanjay Sharma, Professor Martin Hale, and Professor Anna Tong from Singapore. And uh, what we will have here is to 
maybe give you a, a sort of a quick uh, question and answer summary of a, a very exhaustive uh, document that has just been uh, released at the ESC 2020 on spark sports cardiology, in particular the guidelines. I think uh, with a lot of people advocating uh, cardiac rehab as well as uh, physical activity, this is really a very important time for us to understand more how we can safely advise uh, most of our patients, especially those at risk. I think to start off with, let me invite uh, Professor Martin Halle to uh, talk to us a little bit about the assessment for patients who are, you know, who need uh, to go on to an exercise program. Professor Halle? Yes, hello. Um, good morning, everybody. So I would like to stress again, Professor Sharma has pointed out, let's stress again, what are we doing in those individuals aged, aged over 35 years um, and um, do we do any um, any Im imaging or exercise testing? So what we do regarding risk factors and then prescription or exercise. So I think the two points are very important. First is, what is the cardiovascular risk? So we define this as low versus high. So if there is a high risk, and this is the point like uh, elevated LDL cholesterol levels, diabetes, chronic kidney disease. Um, so is there a high risk? Then it is also the second uh, issue is important. What kind of intensity is physical activity that shall be performed? And uh, if this is low, then uh, no further investigation is recommended. But if it's high or very high even, then we go for further assessment. And as uh, Sanjay Sharma pointed out, uh, it's not only exercise testing, but it is then also functional imaging or coronary CTA. Okay, thanks, Martin. So maybe we'll just have a uh, move along to uh, ask uh, Sanjay to tell us a little bit about, you know, chronic coronary syndrome, which is one of the bulk of uh, cardiovascular medicine these days. Prof Sharma? Yes, well, chronic coronary syndromes uh, encompasses uh, a variety of conditions, including stable angina, those people who have previously had acute coronary syndrome, and those people who've had either percutaneous revascularization or surgical revascularization for coronary artery disease. And in these individuals, the important thing is to check for inducible myocardial ischemia. So it's absolutely crucial that anyone with chronic coronary syndrome undergoes a maximal exercise stress test or equivalent to check for inducible myocardial ischemia. Those people that have inducible myocardial ischemia that want to engage in intensive exercise or competitive sport require invasive coronary angiography with view to revascularization before they can actually compete in high intensity sport. Clearly, if these individuals are relatively stable and can be managed on medications, then we still encourage exercise, but it's usually low to moderate intensity exercise rather than intensive competitive sport. I should point out that apart from inducible myocardial ischemia, there are other risk factors that we have to take into account. And that includes uh, a basal low left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 50%, evidence of exercise induced complex arrhythmias, and the fact that someone may have had a, an acute coronary syndrome within one year. So apart from inducible myocardial ischemia, if an individual has impaired left ventricular systolic function, exercise-induced complex arrhythmias, and has been less than 12 months uh, following um, revascularization, uh, they should not compete until that period is over. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Sharma. I believe uh, we now can uh, have a little presentation from uh, uh, Professor Anna Tong, who's gonna tell us a little bit about the uh, um, Singapore experience, I suppose. And then later on, we'll take some questions and uh, have some open discussion. Dr. Anathong? Oh, thank you, Dr. Craig. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, I see on my screen, uh, my slide there. Um, so essentially, this is a, a local study from Singapore. And, uh, and it was published last year in a local journal. Um, so obviously, when we talk about sports cardiology, we talk about pre-participation screening and uh, uh, sports evaluation eligibility. The aim is to prevent sudden cardiac death. So knowing uh, what causes sudden cardiac death in our country is very critical uh, to, to help us to decide what to do about that. So in our study, uh, we look at 11 years uh, review of sports-related sudden cardiac death 
and all deaths were verified by autopsy. And uh, as you can see from this chart here, uh, interestingly, uh, regardless of age of less than 35 or more than 35 years old, ischemic heart disease is the most common cause of sports-related sudden cardiac death in our population. And in the young athletes, surprisingly, we didn't see any case of confirmed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Rather, dilated cardiomyopathy was the second most common cause of sports-related sudden cardiac death in our population, and followed by myocarditis, anomalous coronary arteries, and sudden arrhythmic death syndrome. If you look at the young competitive athletes, uh, out of the four sudden cardiac deaths, two were due to congenital coronary anomalies. And anecdotally, we have noticed uh, rising uh, more cases of anomalous coronary arteries in our young athletes in Singapore, probably because uh, we are doing more and more CT coronary angiogram uh, locally. So I think this, uh, the findings of this uh, study uh, will, will might have impact on how we conduct our pre-participation uh, screening strategies in our young uh, athletes in Singapore. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Anderson. Uh, maybe at this juncture, we can uh, ask the panel to maybe discuss some of their hot points uh, that they think should be highlighted. I think we have seen the experience. I think it is not uh, uh, uncommon, I think, in this part of the world. In fact, in any part of the world, to actually see young athletes or young people embarking on exercise, uh, dying suddenly, and it's always a, a shock for uh, the family members as well as for physicians. Um, how, how best can we address this? I mean, just, just uh, as maybe a uh, serendipity, um, just yesterday, I saw a patient, a 47-year-old patient, who actually came in uh, on extreme exercise, stage five on the on the EK on the stress EKG, and it turned out he has got a very rapid AF. Uh, uh, Prof. Sharma, would you like to discuss that? I mean, you have atrial fibrillation, fit young man, 40 years old, always exercising in the gym, and then you know you do a assessment, and it's got this rapid AF, which just turns on at the peak of exercise. What do you do with this sort of patient? Well, I should start by saying that exercise is actually good for most people. So people who exercise moderately uh, reduce their risk of atrial fibrillation. However, there is a U-shaped relationship between exercise and atrial fibrillation. And certainly middle-aged men that have been exercising for many, many years, particularly in, in endurance sport, are at a five-fold greater risk of atrial fibrillation compared to uh, their age-matched counterparts. Now, there are multiple potential theories for these and this includes that exercise causes atrial stretch it may also cause inflammation of the atria and also scarring of the atria we also know that uh, increased vagal tone could shorten the refractory period of the atrial action potential and all of these things can promote atrial fibrillation and there are many many methods of actually assessing these sort of individuals clearly the first thing is to exclude an underlying cause and it's very important to inquire about alcohol history and something that physicians tend to shy away from, things like performance, performance enhancing agents. It's important to exclude hyperthyroidism, to check for structural heart disease, and then, of course, assess the chads vas score in case these individuals may benefit uh, from anticoagulation to reduce their risk of systemic thromboembolism. Everybody should perform a maximal exercise stress test, as your patient did, really to check for the ventricular rate and to check for inducible myocardial ischemia. Now, there, are, there may be people that can actually exercise without any symptoms with a rapid, re relatively rapid, but not an excessively rapid ventricular rate. And those sort of individuals may not require any treatment as such. But clearly, if people are having troublesome symptoms, uh, the advice really is to ask them to cut down the intensity of their physical activity by about 20%. Uh, one can either adopt a, a rate control in someone who's got um, persistent atrial fibrillation by using drugs such as beta blockers on the understanding that they may impair athletic performance. The other option, of course, is the pill in the pocket approach with class one antiarrhythmic agents such as flecainide or propafenone. But it's important to, uh, to emphasize that these drugs can convert atrial fibrillation to atrial flutter with one to one conduction and cause real trouble. So if someone has, has had to take flecainide in the pill in the pocket approach, they should wait for two half lives to pass before engaging in intensive exercise. These agents are not good as standard drugs for monotherapy to treat uh, this situation. Clearly, um, pulmonary vein isolation is now gaining vogue. 
uh, there are several studies emerging that demonstrate that the efficacy of this particular therapy is as good in endurance athletes versus non-endurance athletes, although uh, they may require at least one procedure to achieve the 85% success rate. One thing we don't know is whether ongoing endurance exercise after treating uh, atrial fibrillation with pulmonary brain isolation may accelerate the onset of atrial fibrillation in the future. Uh, and all of this clearly has to be discussed as well as the very uh, small risk of um, serious complications that can occur with pulmonary brain isolation. Okay. Thanks. What about uh, Martin? Would you like to uh, maybe share with us uh, your approach to this sort of patients, uh, you know, relatively symptom-free patients who, you know, just embark on some exercise, they develop an arrhythmia, um, you know, do you need to investigate a little bit more uh, extensively, non-invasively or even invasively? Well, I think uh, you have to treat um, an athlete the same way as other patients. I think that's important. Um, um, that's uh, regarding diagnostics. Uh, this is particularly, as pointed out um, previously, is the maximal exercise testing that should, uh, sh um, should be performed. And this is, uh, um, as I can recall from our country, in cardiology units, we do not uh, perform a maximal exercise testing. By exercise, ma exercise testing, I mean really max, max, max. So uh, in those individuals who perform exercise on a regular basis, who are, for instance, endurance athletes, um, but do have a, like a family history, positive family history or hypercholesterolemia, they have the same risk of uh, developing um, atherosclerosis of the coronaries. The, the difference is that they do have a very good microcirculation. Uh, so this means that uh, the, the ischemia, even if they, they have the same amount of um, uh, uh, stenosis as others, uh, that uh, ischemia is, uh, is delayed. So it is very important uh, to really stress uh, during maximal exercise testing. And uh, at the end, uh, and this is my experience, at the end, you see that they either have um, signs of ischemia on ECG um, and, uh, or, or other, or arrhythmias during ECG. And one, one really important issue uh, on this is, uh, from my perspective, athletes do have symptoms. So um, they, they know their body very well. So they tell you, well, doc, I do have like uh, five or 10 beats per minute uh, um, higher when I run the same course and I run the same course every day, but there is something different. Um, then they say, oh, uh, I felt something, uh, you know, I have a little bit more dyspnea. These are signs uh, that clearly indicate this, this individual may have obstructive coronary disease or, or other abnormalities. Um, so I, this, is, this is important that, um, that you listen to, to the athlete because he or she knows his or her body a lot better than just the sedentary individual. Okay, thank you very much. In fact, uh, that that actually is a point that uh, we always tell our patients: you must listen to your body. That if you know if you've been exercising, don't assume that you'll always be fit forever. And this is especially for those who are older. But even for young people, you know the the, the no pain no gain strategy may be actually very risky. Uh, by the way, um, what about Anna Anna Thong? Uh, what what do you think? I mean, knowing your your data from Singapore now. I mean, how would you approach patients like that? Dr. Tong? Uh, uh, Dr. Tong, you're referring to a patient with atrial fibrillation or? Sorry, I can't hear you very well, Dr. Tong. Atrial fibrillation? So I did see, uh, I mean, um, just about last month, I had this um, sort of a recreational jogger. He does the occasional marathon. And he felt some excessive palpitation when he was running one day. And uh, he saw a, a family doctor and they found, found, found that he has atrial fibrillation with good ventricular rate. Uh, now, this guy is not a competitive athlete. He's just recreational. Uh, he has small symptoms. Um, and so he saw a private cardiologist and he was offered catheter ablation. 
um, he doesn't require, he, he wasn't key on anticoagulation because his CHET bus score was only uh, zero. He was young, he was only uh, 42 years old. And um, so he came to see me and asked me whether he should really go for the catheter ablation. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, I mean, I would like to open this question to Professor Sharma and Professor Halle as well. Um, a very young, you know, non-competitive uh, athlete with uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, mildly symptomatic and not um, keen on medication or catheter ablation. And, um, and uh, also, uh, when you look at the atrial fibrillation, I understand that the mechanism of AF in athletes is due to bradycardia induced. And uh, it can op uh, occur more often in the night. And looking at him, we did a holter. He has a lot of atrial ectopics. It looks like, you know, it's a foci uh, in the pulmonary vein. And it may not be due to his athletic endeavor because his uh, sports intensity not that much and his sports dosing, he doesn't really run, you know, that much. Uh, so not too sure whether the AF is really due to the athlete uh, pursuit or whether it is just, you know, a, a, a topic, you know, for foresight, uh, uh, autoerythmic uh, AF. So, you know, in the end, uh, I, I say it's totally up to him. He's not competitive, you know, and uh, he has a choice, but if he's symptomatic, then, you know, um, Okay, okay, thanks. thanks. Uh, what, what about Martin? Uh, what do you think? Um, how would you approach that particular patient, for example? I mean, this is this is actually quite typical. We are going to see a lot more patients. I think with this new guideline, which is actually very structured, uh, it's going to also open up a lot more questions about how much we need to to look at our patient and investigate. I know the risk stratification is important. Martin? Yeah, I mean, in, in this individual who's, who is not an athlete, I, I mean, I would treat this individual as I treat all my other uh, patients. Uh, I think the difference, as, as Sanjay already pointed out, is uh, the, the athletic performance in those who are doing endurance exercise, just to point out that uh, this is a problem in endurance exercise and, and uh, mostly not in the others. So I think that... Um, um, the, 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 also, the, uh, what Anna pointed out, the bradycardia in used arrhythmias uh, in athletes. Yeah, that's a problem. And, um, and uh, the, the treatment of beta blockers is in an individual with a resting heart rate of 45 or 50 is, is not applicable. So there, there, is, there are a lot of issues uh, uh, that have to be uh, considered in, in, in this respect. From my experience, um, it is um, when you when when there is um, um, a real need because of symptoms in the athlete, and the athletes are the ones who tell you, "Oh, after two or three times, stop." No, no, no. This is it. I want the ablation um, because it, because it is um, such a severe um, influence on my life. Severe uh, symptoms I experience when I do a, I do have atrial fibrillation that I want the ablation. <clears throat> So I think in, in my perspective, we go um, probably a little bit more rapid to pulmonary uh, vein um, isolation uh, than, uh, than in others, um, in sedentary individuals. So uh, we are actually a little bit uh, progressive in, in this respect. Fair I, think, um, yeah. I think the Excuse important me. thing, of course, here is that this person's young, and that's very, very important. And I think we need to also... Um, bring home the fact that young people with atrial fibrillation may have an underlying cardiomyopathy or an ion channelopathy that needs to be investigated before proceeding straight to a pulmonary vein isolation because it could be a missed opportunity of identifying a condition that could potentially cause a sudden death. Okay, I, I think that's a very important points here. I think we've got some uh, good discussion, obviously within this very short 20-30 uh, minutes of uh, discussion, we can't cover all the ground. I think it's worth uh, maybe letting me summarize very quickly. I think what uh, Prof Sanjay has mentioned earlier, if you had a uh, acute coronary syndrome recently within the first year, I think you have to be a bit more circumspect about getting back to your full fitness, particularly if you're going into extreme sport. Go gentle and uh, talk to your cardiologist or physician before you do anything more. And on top of it, uh, if you are young, on the other hand, and you want to go into competitive sport, or even if you have symptoms, you should be assessed. And I think the the, the term here is to have a conversation. Let's talk to your physicians about what you want to go, what you want to achieve, and then see how far you're prepared to investigate. Uh, I mean, I don't mind telling you that I've lost a young man 
uh, who just started a program and uh, everything normal. He did you know, because he, he had a bit of palpitations. We did a, a, an echo. He was normal. EKG was normal. No Brugada syndrome. Um, and then he went running one of the days and then he dropped dead. You know, So it's one of those things that uh, is always a bit frightening for most of us. But nevertheless, I think uh, what is important is that uh, we, we know what to do now. I think this document is going to be very important. So with that, uh, I think uh, we have reached the end of our session. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, stay tuned for, for the program. Thank you, everyone. Bye mm -hmm. for now. Thank you.